grateful to the concept of inclusion because I don't know why I'm here after what you just saw so far this morning. I don't sing. I don't dance. I don't sign. What else? I'll never be in a beauty pageant. And I certainly won't ever win like Mr. Popular contests. So the only thing from this morning that I get so far is the video that, in fact, I am a person who only needs one shoe. So we'll tell you why. When I was 20 years old, I went to Israel to walk in the footsteps of the prophets, and I was studying re comparative religion. And I was an Irish Catholic boy who grew up outside Boston. I didn't understand Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, very sheltered. And then I was camping in Israel, walking on a beautiful sunny day, and then suddenly, boom, like everything exploded. My whole world exploded underneath me. I didn't even know what a landmine was or that there are actually 80 million landmines buried in over 80 countries and 80% of the victims are civilians, not soldiers. So this is our military litter around the world, killing and maiming children, women, farmers, refugees, and I guess hurting just a dumb tourist like me in Israel. So I spent six months in a hospital in Israel, and that's where I had my introduction to be sensitized to different abilities. Living in a room with people missing their arms, missing their legs, missing their eyes, wheelchairs, every time, burn victims. And so I wondered, how do I get over this at 20 years old? Like being victimized or something, it wasn't my war. I was innocent. So where will I find help? I remember being in the minefield and looking down after the explosion and just chanting, where's my leg? Where's my foot? Where's my foot? Where's my foot? Where's my foot? And I've thought a lot about that. Like, I couldn't get over at my missing piece. We all have missing pieces. So I went on a quest to find out how to become whole again. Where is resilience? Where is my hope? Where is my new fake leg? And the research on resilience done in great depth at Yale University gives you this list of the 10 hallmarks of resilience. Optimism, altruism, moral compass, faith in spirituality, humor, having a role model, social support, facing fear, having a mission, and training. So inclusion here, the summit, we are a source of resilience. This is social. There's nothing on that list that you're actually born with. Maybe a little optimism if you're lucky. So we need each other for resilience. So I went looking for more people who knew the secret of resilience. And I also went looking for a role model. And I found it in other survivors, and I found it in Diana, the Princess of Wales, who became our champion for the landmine issue. She put a human face on it. So here you have the most photographed beautiful woman in the world, the most famous woman in the world, shedding her light on a very dark issue victims around the world. So there on the, the left-hand side is Ken Rutherford. He lost both his legs in a landmine in Somalia. And then the two boys on either side of her are actually William and Harry's age. So you have Jarko on the left. He was 12 years old, Serbian boy. Went out after the war to pick up firewood and got blown up. And then you have Malic, a Bosnian Muslim boy, on the right of the princess, and he also lost his leg. And then there's me when I had a little more hair on the far side. And you know that story now. So who had the best legs on the log? Come on. <laughs> you can say it. 
Diana. Amazing. But the Princess of Wales had something more. That when we visited survivors, three days, this was her last humanitarian mission in August of 1997. So we're taking her all around to introduce her to other survivors and she meets another family where the widow is there because the husband went fishing after the war, reeled a landmine in that exploded on him and he died. And it had only been a couple months before and the princess was very quiet, tears rolling down her eyes. She listened, she touched, and then a while afterwards, when we were back in the car traveling, she said, you know what? Every survivor, every landmine victim you introduce me to tells me their date. I'm April 12th, 1984, ma'am. And Ken Rutherford says, well, I'm December 16th, 1993. And everyone had a date suddenly. And the princess said, you know what? I think I'm July 29th. 1981, which is the day she married Prince Charles. <laughs> this shows enormous social and emotional intelligence that you would know the trauma distilled is a before and after moment. It's a date where nothing is ever the same again. Could be a marriage, could be a birth, could be a different ability, could be a traumatic war or shock. So how many here have dates? I feel sorry for you. <laughs> you don't even have birth dates? Those are traumatic. So how many here have a birth date? How many here are going to have a death date? And how many are going to have middle dates? Anniversaries where life is different. So this is what we do. How do you turn, let's say you're the victims and you had awful war experiences and you're refugees and life is awful, even beyond your disability, but you're feeling awful and living in the past, you have hallmarks of what I call victimhood. So that's living in the past, sort of stuck on that date. Self-pity, resenting, blaming. It's an insatiable condition. So taking, taking. No amount of giving or generosity is going to fill the hole of the missing piece from the trauma. So we don't blame victims. We just must understand when is victimhood in play? When are politicians using victimhood to stoke fires? And what do we do about victim language? So then we look, what have the survivors taught us? I met with thousands all around the world, from Bosnia to Vietnam to Angola to Mozambique to Jordan and elsewhere. And they were the ones who taught survivor wisdom, which was number one, five steps to resilience. And this is what I was seeking, some missing piece. How can I find my resilience? Number one, face facts. This awful thing has happened. You can't turn back the clock. The past is gone. My leg is not going to grow back. I'm not a starfish. <laughs> My hair's not going to grow back. <laughs> These are facts. And emotions are facts, too. We think of them as sort of muddy or subjective. It's a fact. I'm depressed. I want to die. I miss my missing piece. Emotions are facts, and you must face them early, or they will find you. And number two, choose life. I mean, this is a celebration of life. Hope that you aren't defined by your one thing, whether a traumatic day or a piece of disability indifference. That's not who we are. I'm not a fake leg. I'm not one shoe. My name is Jerry. I'm whole. So choosing life is that hope. Thank you. So we need each other. I am not complete without you. So the third step of reaching out is fundamentally understanding that isolation will kill you. We need support. We need our families. We need each other. I needed two guys to carry me out of a minefield. 
I needed nurses, I needed doctors, I need rehabilitation, I need a prosthetic limb made by a talented prosthetist. I need a lot. We need a lot. But it's here, in each other. So our missing pieces are actually often in front of us. And the fourth thing I would say that the survivors teach you is you must do it. I have my thing, you have your thing, you have your thing. You don't want my thing, I don't want your thing. We all got some things. So get moving on your thing. You know, when I first was in a wheelchair, I didn't know how to sort of get out of bed, get in it safely and maneuver. I didn't learn the, how to do wheelies or anything fun. And the first day they came to me after weeks in a hospital bed and put me in a chair, I waited for the nurse to now push me down to the cafeteria for lunch. And she looked at me and she laughed. You probably know, know the experience. She said, Jerry, if you want to move, push, push. We must push, you must push. You must get out of bed in the morning. So sometimes it's very, very hard, but that's part of resilience that I learned from survivors. You do you, your thing, and push. And fifth is the secret sauce, of course, giving. Like those survivors who had moved from victimhood to surviving to thriving, I would call it, they knew and had a smile on their face. They may be missing all their limbs, they may be missing their family, be displaced, and you're thinking they didn't get the memo of how awful their life is. They're smiling. Why? They're the givers. In small and big ways, they listen, they smile, they give, they offer support. And therein lies their deep resilience. So I thought, this is great. I'm learning about resilience. Maybe I can teach it. Maybe I can help others. Maybe we can stop other people from being blown up by landmines. So we use this treaty, we create a ban internationally. P.S. India and the U.S. haven't signed the ban yet, so I'll speak to you after class. <laughs> but here we are in Israel, I go back to the scene of the crime, and I say, Israel, can you ban weapons? The holy land shouldn't be a deadly land, right? And walking in the footsteps of the prophets, you should be safe, right? So nothing was being done. I was looking for the missing piece. I talked to generals. I was like, where's, who will stand up with courage? And I found it in this boy, 11-year-old Danny Yuval. It was his first snowfall. He went on a picnic with his family, en route to his grandmother's. He made his first snowball. He ran into the field. His sister and brothers ran after them, five kids running in with the parents laughing before their lunch. Boom. Blood everywhere. Danny stepped on a landmine. 11 years old, lands him in the same hospital where I had been years and years before. Even where he stepped on a landmine was nearby where I also was injured. There was no fence, there was no sign, there was just a field of snow. And when I went to go visit the family in Tel Aviv, little Danny looked up at me and said, Jerry, you've worked to ban landmines. How can we make sure that no other kid like me gets hurt? Very simple. And why many of us are in this type of work, how can we make sure that others are not as disadvantaged, that others don't feel the pain that I felt? This was a very pure child where his innocence called the country to action. So if we're asking, is it, is it 11 years old too young to have wisdom? If, is 11 years old too young to change the world? Should Malala have been older? Should Nadia Murad, the Yazidi, be more than 25? Our children are trying to talk to us about changing the world. And in some respects, I feel ashamed that I can't do more, that we are behind in delivering to the next generation the lovely planet we're supposed to be on. So this boy goes from a hospital, this is literally a couple hours after a surgery, where he's planning a mind-free Israel campaign. He becomes a youth ambassador. 
and he goes all the way to the top. Israel is not an easy country. India is not an easy country. The US is not an easy country. To have a boy call out the prime minister and say, very simply, how can we make sure this doesn't happen to other kids like me? Later on, when legislation passed in Israel with a unanimous vote in the Knesset about landmines, a security issue, during the Arab Spring, Tipi Livni, Netanyahu, the prime minister, and others looked at me and said, Jerry, we could say no to you, but we could not say no to the boy. Innocence, beauty, simplicity, finding our missing piece. So lastly, I would say, I've been in search of my missing piece for a while. And I even thought I found it in resilience and in all my survivor friends and all my people with disabilities and different abilities all around the world. I thought, ah. And I wondered, why am I still so agitated? Why am I still so sad? What's wrong with me? Why do I have a hole in my heart? It has nothing to do with my leg. Why am I a wounded being? So I realized that these issues of landmines or advocacy or barriers and inclusion and exclusion were things that we must go inside. And India has that secret in its DNA. I'm late to learning it. I must demine my heart. I must remove the barriers of exclusion inside me. And I must move away from my fear of death and explosion and exclusion. If I can do that, or as I do it, I don't think it's chronological, then perhaps we can find wholeness. So I, I close by saying, in coming here and looking out at all of you, I see my missing pieces. You know, it was His Holiness the Dalai Lama who said once to me, Jerry, there is no us and them, you've heard. There is no we and they, all is one. So maybe there's no inclusion and exclusion. We all are like one, you're in me. You fill my missing piece. I hope a piece of me is in you for the fragments and missing pieces and sadness and scars we have. Together, we are whole and find peace, which is about fullness and wholeness. Shalom. So thank you. Thank you.